Ladies and gentlemen, the program will begin in five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn off all mobile devices. The program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David McAdam, Chief Executive Officer, Middle East Council of Shopping Centers. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to uh, 2014 Recon Conference, our 20th anniversary in existence, and it's all made possible through your efforts to be here, your time to contribute, your investment with our organization, and your just being in the industry overall. So thank you very much. There's just one thing that I want to start with before we get going too far, and that uh, Vina Disa, our vice president of the organization, who's been responsible for the majority of what you see, it's actually her birthday today. So please, when you see Vina, can you just congratulate her and wish her a happy birthday? And more importantly, this evening there is going to be a cake of monumental proportions rolled in here for our awards dinner. And we want to make sure that Vina gets a piece of that cake for her birthday cake as well. Anyway, so when you see Vina, wish her happy birthday. The lead up to this conference today has been truly an energized event. We've had so many people from so many corners of the world coming to us and asking what we can do, how they can help, how they can be involved in the organization. It's been an incredible boost to our uh, membership and to what we do here in the MECSC. What we try and do is facilitate your business. And we try and raise your personal profile in the industry. And today, through our networking, and through this conference, that's what we want to try and do for all of us. But, you know, it really begins with you to reach out to those people beside you, around you, in front of you, and talk to them and ask them what they're doing in the industry and share stories and share, build a relationship with them because that's what this conference is really all about. We have some of the best and brightest minds from around the world making presentations today. And I think we're all going to learn a lot, and I think that's an important part. But if we take one thing away today, it would be I'd hope that everyone here can build at least one relationship with one other person in this room that you haven't yet, because one relationship is another, is another, is another, and pretty soon you have a network of people you can rely on in the industry to help you succeed at what you do. And that's what our mission is as well. 
We've had a lot of uh, great things coming as a result of this conference. We've got the awards dinner this evening. We've got, uh, we started out and we had around 350 people for the tables and they were sold out and then we had about 420 and I was talking to Malachi in New York about it and he goes, okay, well that's enough. And I said, well now we have 520. So we have a very uh, cozy atmosphere and people have said to me they'd like to see a very intimate affair and I can assure you the room with 520 people, it'll be this room by the way, with 520 people at tables will be very lovely. So. It'll be a great evening, so thank you very much for all of those who have already booked it, and it is sold out, just so you know. We also last night had our book launch for our Souks to Malls book, which has been great, and everyone who comes to the event tonight will get a copy of that book, and every member who asks for a copy of that book will also be uh, gifted a copy of the book. It's 180 pages, a hard copy book, and it's uh, titled Souks to Malls, A Retail Evolution in the Gulf. So. We look forward to having everyone have one of those. Also, our Retail People magazine. It'll be a great opportunity for all of us to have a look at ourselves uh, in this edition, and then also the next one's coming out in January. The recon event that we have today will be the showcase of our January edition of the book. So anyone who's here will probably have a multitude of photographs. We normally have two to 3,000 photographs to sift through to make sure that everyone's copied with it. But let me start, first of all, by introducing our MC for the day. And he's no stranger to uh, all of us in the room. He's on the drive show in the morning. And Richard Dean is a journalist and a broadcaster living and working in Dubai. He spent the past decade covering the Middle East for some of the world's leading media organizations, including The Economist, The Financial Times, and Reuters. Richard currently presents Business Breakfast, which I'm sure we're all aware of if you're in the town at 103.8, and it's a daily business radio show. His first book was published in May 2010 called Sink or Swim, How to Stay Afloat in Tough Economic Times. And when we asked Richard to come and be the MC, Master of Ceremonies for the day, he was thrilled and honored, and I know most of us already know Richard through his business contacts and, and his knowledge of the industry overall. So please join me in welcoming Richard to the stage. Thank you. Well, David, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for those kind words and warm words of introduction. Genuinely, it's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today as your MC, not just today, but this evening for the award ceremony as well, and then back again tomorrow. But of course, David, you and I both know that Events like this don't happen without an awful lot of hard work by a lot of people behind the scenes, you, Bina, and the team. And also without a lot of support from sponsors and partners. So we're going to take a couple of minutes now, aren't we, just to recognize them and thank them for their contribution. That's a great idea. Thanks, Richard. All right, well, look, I'll start off with the Platinum Sponsors. And I think everyone understands that our organization survives on how the support comes through financial and through also contribution of time, effort, and energy into making these shows happen, the conferences, networking events, education programs all working. So our platinum sponsors this year, Hamat Property Company, and we really thank you for that. It's been amazing to work with you, and I think you've seen your trolleys. That's got your branding on it as well. Thank you very much. Arabian Centers also, Simon and his team, we appreciate your support again this year. It's been amazing to have you here with us. And uh, we're asking if you could make your stand a little bit bigger next year so you could be recognized a little more, if you didn't mind. Also, our annual sponsors, we have the Pearl Qatar. So thank you very much. And they've donated a book, the bag for the book tonight that'll be launched. And everyone will get a copy of that. Keenan, JG, thanks very much for being here as well and your team. And uh, also for the welcome res uh, reception and for the delegate badges. Thank you for that contribution. Our gold sponsors, Mohammed Alawi, Red Sea Mall, thank you very much for your continuing support for the organization and, and for all that we do in this region, so thank you. Aswak, Jean Hervé, and Guillaume, thank you very much for your, for your contribution to us as well and for your efforts to put together your team here and your stand, it's great. Intima, Alothame Mall, thank you very much for that, we appreciate that. And Sharouk, again this year, thank you for being with us. Alothaim was also with us last year, and Intima as well. As well, bronze sponsors. 
Now, Yardi has been with us for a number of years, and we really, truly appreciate their support. They're involved in the software business, and they are um, always looking to try and improve their product and make sure that the penetration into the market is working. And through our organization, they've been successful in achieving that. So we thank you, Yardi, as well. Muscat Grand Mall, and we, we really thank you. I know that it's just uh, getting going in this whole organization and building that the project out, but thank you very much for supporting us. And a new one this year, Amher Malls, thank you very much for your support as well as a bronze sponsor. Also helping us out today, our conference breaks and lunch sponsor. Thanks very much indeed to Doha Festival City for your support. The Lanyard sponsor and Gala gift bag sponsor, the Pearl Qatar. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much indeed. Delegate bag sponsor, Hamat Property. Your contribution has been noted already. Thank you. And of course, our gala and delegate gift sponsors, in some ways, the ones we look forward to the most. Uh, Alakazai Premium Tea, Apparel Group. We've got Bath and Body Works, Damani Jewelry, and Patchy Chocolates. Thanks very much indeed to all of you. Thanks, Richard. And then for our support partners, AZDEF Group, Rayan, thank you for being here again. And I know we have a lot to look forward with who you're providing for us as entertainment and uh, part of it today. Thank you, Rayan, for your support. The flowers are amazing, and I've seen photographs of what we're going to enjoy this evening with V Flower Boutique. Thank you very much for your support. Our strategic partner, Wright Selection Group, so Gautam and Ram, thank you very much for what you're doing for us. We truly appreciate all your efforts in that regard. Our media partners, Helen Kay with the International New York Times, thank you. I haven't seen Helen yet, but thank you for contributing what you've done. SCT Magazine, and uh, this year it's amazing. What happens is, is that our voices are being recognized in the region, and I know Mike has a, when I, when I show a magazine like this, he actually cringes, but this time I'm going to do it. This is the SCT Magazine, and about six months ago, I asked the people in New York if they wouldn't mind running a feature on Iran. I was in Iran, I was fortunate enough to be invited to Iran to uh, give a speech at one of the conferences, and so they've put forward a, a, a great article on Iran, but this is the SCT magazine out of New York, Shopping Centers Today, hosted and run by ICSC. So thanks very much for that. And then RLI Jane, thanks again for you being here as well. And our official airline partner, Emirates Airlines, they are also providing some gifts tonight for our gala. I appreciate your support. And many of the people who have traveled here from around the world have enjoyed a benefit of a bit of a reduced fare, which is part of their contribution to our organization. And Emirates Airlines, we really truly thank you for that. So with that, I thank the Ritz-Carlton team and their, their work for with us. It's been amazing, and uh, a lot of work has gone into it. So I will leave you now in Richard's great hands, and I will step aside. But thank you very much, everyone, and uh, we look forward to the show today. Thanks. David, thanks very much indeed for that. So what a great time to be at it, for a journalist at least, to be covering an event that covers the retail industry, the shopping industry. I don't know if you can see this. Can we get one of the cameras on this, maybe? It's the uh, uh, front page of the business section of the national newspaper here in the UAE in Abu Dhabi yesterday. I'll read the headline for you. It says, premium on space at top shopping malls rises to a new high. That's the story there. Their lead story just yesterday. Great timing from those guys. And these are the stories that... I guess like guys like The National and Reuters and, and myself at Dubai Eye, we cover a lot these days. Great time to be in retail. The thing is, though, as, as we all know in this room, there are potential villains in this great story. You've got e-commerce, of course. You've got potential oversupply of shopping malls in the UAE and Saudi Arabia, across the Gulf and the wider region. And then just yesterday, perhaps economic downturn is on the way. Who knows? The Dubai financial market, stock market down 7% yesterday. We'll see what, it hap what happens today. Now, we don't know how this is going to play out, but we know that there are complications. We know that there are challenges, and that poses the question, what is the shopping mall of the future going to look like if we're going to ride these challenges and perhaps other challenges that we don't even think about just yet? And that's why we're here today. So as master of ceremonies, I'm going to make three promises to you. What are we going to achieve today before the award ceremony and tomorrow? Three things, really. One, I can promise you this. You will learn something. 
you will gain some useful insights. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers. They're going to share their insights with you. So number one, you'll learn something. But number two, almost as important, is that you will contribute to that learning. Everybody in the room will contribute to that. It was Albert Einstein who said that the formulation of the question is almost as important as the solution. So the questions that you ask during the panel discussions and during the breakout sessions, they're almost as important as the speeches and presentations you hear, to say, to, you hear today. So number two is that you will contribute to knowledge and understanding and insight of this industry. And the third thing is to echo David's point about networking, about contacts. My pledge to you is that by the time you leave here, you will have one business card, one significant business card that you didn't have before you came, because networking is important. And in fact, David, I recall, where's David? You and I were having a, a cup of coffee in Dubai Mall just last week about this event, looking forward to it. Um, we had a cup of coffee in Tim Hortons. Canadians are so predictable. <laughs> so we had, we had a cup of coffee, and he said the one bit of feedback from last year was that everybody wanted more time to network, to talk to people. So we thought, okay, that's fine, we'll do that. We'll make sure that happens. There are less presentations on the agenda and more time for networking, so we do hope that you take advantage of that. But now let's move to our first speaker this morning, someone who is a stranger to nobody in this room, I suggest, to make the welcome address. He's the CEO of Red Sea Markets. Red Sea Mall Jeddah is the largest shopping mall in Jeddah. Previously VP, Vice President Asset Management in Saudi Arabia for MAF Property, also country head of MAF Shopping Malls in Saudi Arabia. A past president for the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers. Will you join me in giving a very warm welcome this morning to Mohammed Alawi. Mohammed, please join us. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Richard, for this uh, interested uh, introduction. Just one comment that you guys, the reporter, always talk about shopping mall owners increasing rent and uh, capex and all things. But you never talk about the fortune retailer they make. <laughs> so please, next time, tell us more about retailer, how become a giant making money eh? through our properties. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you. I've been asked to give this welcome in Arabic, and I will do that. Uh, I don't know why they pick me on behalf of the board, but I think size is matter sometimes, <laughs> not age. <laughs> Okay. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Sayyidina Mursaleen. Al-Ukhwa wa al-Akhwat. Al-Akh al-Aziz, Majid Saif al-Gharir, Rais Majlis, Majlis Marak al-Sharq al-Awsat. Sa'at al-Sayyid Michael Kirchhoff, Rais Majlis al-Mudirin, li Majlis Marak al-Tasawuq al-Alami, New York. Sayyidat al-Sada al-Hudur al-Kiram. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In nome of the sururi, wa fakhri, wa atizazi, and yet me khtiari al hadith ilaykum niyabatan an majlis al mudirin, li majlis marakiz al sharq al awsat, li tarhibukum jami'an, fil mu'tamar al sanawi lanam, wa tamar rikon al sharq al awsat al fain warba tashar. A lady you saw the faidan, hadi sana, murur al shirin am, ala insha al markaz, al majlis. منذ تأسيسه عام 1994 الذي يجعل من أمامنا تحديات كبيرة ولكن النظر الخلف يعطينا نظرة واقعية لمستقبل المجلس الأخوة والأخوات الأفاضل إن مجلس مراكز الشرق الأوسط خطى خطوات حثيثة وثابتة وأصبح نقطة محورية لجميع أنشطة مراكز التسوق في منطقتنا الحبيبة واكتسب الكثير من الاحترام والتقدير على المستوى المحلي والإقليمي والعالمي كما أنه خطة التطوير والتنسيق لأنشطته بالتعاون مع المجلس العالمي لمراكز التسوق في نيويورك ICCS أثبتت أن هناك زخم كبير لنمو نشاط مجلسنا في جميع أنشطته التدريب والبحوث والدراسات والفعاليات والمؤتمرات والأنشطة الذي الأمر الذي انعكس إيجابيا على نشاط المجلس وعلى جميع أعضائه الموقرين الأخوة والأخوات الأفاضل نحن نحتفل اليوم بمرور عشرين عام 
على إنشاء وتأسيس مجلسنا وكرر نحن نحتفل اليوم عشرين عام على إنشاء وتأسيس مجلسنا الموقع أمر نفتخر به جميعا وندين بالشكر والتقدير لجميع من ساهموا في إنشاء المجلس أعضاء مجالس الإدارة والمندوبين والموظفين والرؤساء التنفيذيين كما أننا لن ننسى بالتأكيد اليوم أن نوجه شكرا خاصا للأخ العزيز ماجد سيف الغرير رئيس المجلس لما قام به من جهد ودعم تمويل لإنشاء هذا المجلس فأرجو أن مشاركتكم جميعا بشكره جميعا الأخوة والأخوات أيضا من باب الشكر والتقدير لا يجب أن ننسى الدور الكبير والدعم الذي لا يمكن أن ننساه للمجلس العالمي لمراكز التسوق الـ ICCS في نيويورك ونتوجه من هذا المنبر بخالص الشكر والتقدير لجميع منسوبي المجلس العالمي لمراكز التسوق وعلى راسهم السيد مايكل كرشفول الرئيس والرئيس التنفيذي السادة والسيدات إننا مع كل ما تم تحقيقه في الماضي إلا أن طموحاتنا لا تتوقف وسنستمر معا وبالتعاون مع المجلس العالمي لمراكز التسوق في العمل بخطوات أسرع وأكبر لتحقيق كل الأمال المعقودة على مجلسنا والتقرير وكل الأمال المعقودة على مجلسنا والأنشطة المتوقعة منه بإذن الله ونحتاج إلى دعمكم ومساندتكم كأعضاء لهذا المجلس كما أن التعاون مع الجمعية الخيرية التابعة للمجلس العالمي لمراكز التسوق الـ ICC Foundation أيضا سوف يكون نشاطه شامل لمنطقتنا منطقة الشرق الأوسط من حيث توفير برامج المنح الدراسية والتعليمية لأبناء هذه المنطقة أرجو من الجميع المشاركة في دعم هذا البرنامج ونشر المعلومات عنه أيضا لجميع أعضائنا في منطقة الشرق الأوسط كلمة شكر خاصة للسيد ديفيد مكارم على جهوده في إنشاء في تجهيز الاحتفال لهذا اليوم والشكر خاص أيضا لفريق العمل في المجلس على رأسهم السيدة فينا الذين قد قضوا كثير من الوقت في الإعداد والتكريم والتجهيز لهذه الأشياء فشكرا خاص لهم جميعا شكر خاص للرعاة أنا واحد منهم طبعا <تصفيق> شكر خاص للرعاة والداعمين والمنظمين والمتحدثين في المؤتمر لجهودهم وفي الختام أتقدم لكم بخالص الشكر والتقدير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته محمد شكرا Thank you very much indeed for those insightful comments Well we move to our guest speaker shortly Doug Stevens looking forward to hearing from him but first of all I think it's important that we get a global perspective on what's happening here in the region now. And who better to deliver that than the president and CEO of the International Council of Shopping Centers. He's been with the ICSC since 2000 and in fact before that spent for about 20 years, two decades or so, in real estate investment banking. A graduate of the University of Colorado holding advanced degrees in economics from Columbia University to talk about the relevance of tourism to retail. Would you please join me in welcoming Michael Kercheval. Michael, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Mohammed Alawi, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you for your introduction this morning. Uh, those of you who don't know, Mohammed is also my boss. He's a member of the International Board of Trustees of the International Council of Shopping Centers. And I'm honored to be here in your presence and with this tremendous group. This has been a pleasure of mine for the last 16 years, coming to Dubai to celebrate the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers. And on this auspicious occasion of the 20th anniversary, it's particularly fitting that we are here and at a time when the industry is rebounding and very robust, not only in the Middle East, not only in Dubai, but around the world. What I'd like to do this morning, over the next few minutes, 
is talk about two things. I want to give you a bit of a, a quick snapshot of what's happening in the industry around the world. And then I want to talk to you about some of the very, very important things that are impacting our industry today and some of the challenges that we are facing today and in the future. And hopefully some of those comments will play directly into the uh, next speakers that we're going to have over the next couple of days. Let me begin by pointing out that the industry has always adapted well to change. And this is a very good thing because today change is happening at a faster pace than ever before and is calling upon all of our professional skills and testing our capabilities unlike at any time in the history of the industry. There are three main drivers of this rapid change. Demographics, technology, and globalization. And without dwelling too much on any one of them, let me just point out some of the key features. The demographic shifts that we're seeing around the globe are causing dramatic changes. In markets where you have a growing middle class and stable governments and an undersupply of retail, we are seeing a shopping center boom taking place. In fact, Ernst & Young, in a study released a couple of years ago, pointed out the significance of this growing middle class, pointing out that by the year 2030, the size of the global middle class is going to reach 5 billion people. And the spending power of the middle class at that point is going to be bigger than the entire spending power of the developed world today. This is truly a dramatic shift driven by demographics that is going to have a profound impact on retail and on shopping centers around the world. At the same time as this growth of the middle class in the emerging markets, we're seeing a slowdown in mature markets, the more established uh, markets around the world where the middle class has plateaued in Europe and in Western Europe in particular. Western Europe has seen a clear shift from new development to redevelopment of their properties. Although we're looking at lots of redevelopment, the sales transactions of properties in Europe is dramatic. In fact, in the United Kingdom, it's been reported that nearly two billion pounds worth of sales of shopping centers has taken place in the first half of this year. A dramatic demand for the asset class in the United Kingdom and across Europe. And in terms of where the activity is likely to be in, with development, in Russia and Eastern Europe, those are enormous zones of opportunity for the shopping center industry. In the United States, the number of new shopping centers opened and the amount of new gross leasable area, or GLA, added to the retail sector was last year less than 2 million square meters. That is a record low, and in fact, 2014 is going to be even less. We are adding less space in retail in the United States than we are taking out. Nevertheless, the population and incomes are growing. Now this slowdown in new development really became necessary because of probably too much development over the last 25 years. In fact, during that 25 year period which ended at the Great Recession, population grew by 47%, but the amount of retail GLA grew by 110% to exceed 800 million square meters of new GLA during that period. Hardly a sustainable situation. The good news, of course, is that a combination of stronger growth from consumers, from retailers, and this lack of new supply have translated into significantly higher rents and rising occupancy rates across the board. And indeed, rents and occupancy rates in the United States have now risen above the pre-recession levels. In the United States, we now are defining the success of our industry not by new development, as perhaps we did in the past, but looking at other metrics. For example, the performance of shopping centers, net operating income, or NOI, in 2013 rose to a record high level and is expected to exceed that again in 2014. And this recovery of performance in the retail sector and in real estate in general has created a new demand for real estate. The most recent was an announcement by CalPERS, the enormous 
pension fund from California, shifting a significant portion of its investments out of hedge funds and into real estate, which in their latest announcement would amount to an increase of $7 billion going into real estate investment from just that one pension fund. So clearly a demand for the asset class on the investment as well as the use side. In these mature markets though, however, we're finding out that success is not just defined by the ability of the product to distribute goods and services. Indeed, our shopping centers around the world are very efficient at distributing goods and services, but today it's more important to look at the contribution of our centers in terms of the social value that they bring. That third place in people's lives, when they're not in their home, and they're not at work where they can go to socialize, to be with other people, to be with their friends, if you will, that third place. And I think here in Dubai, you've done a wonderful job of creating that third place for the citizens of Dubai and truly the citizens of the world. That's the way the shopping center is headed in the future. And we will be thinking not so much of how good we distribute goods and services, but the economic value that our shopping centers create from the social value of our products in the shopping centers. In Latin America, activity continues to be brisk, largely driven by that growing middle class. A.T. Kearney notes that in their global retail development index of the 30 top markets around the world, South America tops that list with Brazil, Chile, and Uruguay taking the top three places, but also Peru, Colombia, Mexico, and Panama make the top 30 list. In fact, growth is so significant throughout South America, we're seeing retailers for the very first time going into new markets throughout South America. A prime example is the department store retailer Falabella, a Chilean department store that has announced a $4.1 billion dollar investment plan over the next three years to open 160 new department stores and 15 shopping malls across Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Uruguay. Meanwhile, a consumer and a retail boom continues to go on through most of Asia. Based on current forecasts, the annual investment volumes of retail property are expected to rise to 160 to 180 billion dollars over the next five years in Asia, according to JLL's research. It also means that there will be a shifting of investment portfolios towards the Asia Pacific region, which by 2020 is expected to account for about 26 over a quarter of all real estate investment, up from around 10% just a few years ago. Within the Asia region, of course, China has been firmly established as the region's largest market. China will have 4,000 shopping malls by next year. That's up from 3,000 shopping malls just last year in 2013. The Chinese government is also predicting that retail sales will roughly double to 5.2 trillion US dollars next year from where they were in just 2011. We're even seeing some redevelopment of existing shopping malls in China. The South China Mall, which was the world's largest shopping mall when it opened in 2005, just reopened after a $32 million renovation and shift of its focus to include more of those experiential components of food and leisure. Apart from China, Hong Kong, Korea, Singapore, and most other countries in East Asia are experiencing a retail real estate boom. This is partly due to the rising local living standards, but it's also in large measure due to the growth of the Chinese consumer and the Chinese economy who are traveling outside of China and shopping in and investing in markets outside of mainland China. Here in the Middle East, and in North Africa, the potential from an economic standpoint is growing. According to the IMF, this year, real GDP growth in the Middle East and North Africa region is forecasted to grow at almost 4%. Sub-Saharan Africa, actually even a little bit faster. But compare those two markets to the developed economies expecting a 2% real GDP growth. And you can see why there's enormous opportunity in the MENA region. Within this region, 
developers such as Majid al Futaim will be spending about $29 million in Oman to renovate Muscat City Center and Kurum City Center. Nikhil has plans to build a 620,000 square meter retail dining and entertainment hub at Diara Islands here in Dubai. Dubai Holdings announced plans to build an 8 million square foot mall in Dubai under a giant dome that would connect to 100 hotels and will be billed as the world's largest and first temperature controlled city. And in North Africa, the French grocery giant Alchon has plans to open five retail centers in Tunisia. The cost would be about $600 million of investment in the Tunisian market. In India, the area around New Delhi, as well as Mumbai, Bangalore, Chennai, and other cities are experiencing strong development growth driven by demand for space by expanding domestic retailers primarily. For now, India's strict preconditions for overseas companies has constrained foreign retail growth in the country, as witnessed by Carrefour's recent exit from the Indian market. But if those conditions begin to lessen, there's plenty of opportunity in the Indian market for shopping center developers and retail markets. A couple of other smaller markets, the Australian market has shown considerable strength last year, not only generating strong retail sales, but also importantly being an important contributor to the employment growth in Australia. And neighboring New Zealand is also an interesting market, a relatively small market with one major city of Auckland, just 1.4 million people. But even in Auckland, they've been able to attract high-end retailers like Prada, Dior, Louis Vuitton, and Gucci, and Topshop coming in at the middle market. But whether we're looking at mature markets or emerging markets, one thing is absolutely certain. Today, the consumer has more power and more information than at any time in history. What's more, that consumer is in a constant state of flux. If you think about it, trends used to change with each fashion season. Today, trends change with each tweet. And how we keep up with that in 21st century retail is the challenge not only for retailers, but also for landlords and developers. We are going to need to combine and integrate communication, technology, customer preferences, service, delivering, warehousing, logistics and inventory, just to name a few of the integratable skills that we're need, going to need to bring together. Google wrote a book called The Zmod Handbook, Ways to Win Shoppers at the Moment of Truth. And they pointed out that the old decision process for a consumer making a purchase decision was beginning with awareness and then moving down to interest, then desire, and then to action. When we think about the consumer and the shopper today, it's a very, very different pattern. In fact, today's shopper has far more options, far more channels to consume, and it looks a bit more like a flight map. A consumer today will look online, they'll look in stores, they will look at catalogs, they will window shop along the street, they'll look at their mobile devices. Lots of technology causing them to bounce around in their decision and their purchasing process. ICSC recently completed a survey to begin to get a bit of a handle on how consumers think in the purchase process. And overall, it was positive. The results were positive for our industry. When we asked consumers about their retail purchases over the last six months, where did you shop? Not how much did you spend, but where did you shop? The overwhelming majority of transactions were completed in store. And as we dug a little bit deeper, we realized the consumers actually like the in-store experience, and they prefer to shop in store for a host of reasons. What's What's more, our survey indicated that nearly 78% of consumers actually always prefer to buy in-store. However, showing the importance of omni-channel, we found that about a third of consumers use the internet to do research online before they go into a store to make a purchase. Therefore, it's imperative that we provide the channel and the opportunities for the consumers to do this pre-purchase research online. And the term that we use for this, we've dubbed as web rooming. Shoppers do their research online, on the web, 
and then they go into the store to make the purchase. Now this is the exact opposite of a situation we were confronted with a few years ago. We called showrooming, where the consumers would go into our shopping malls, they would go into our stores and take our staff's time to explain that to them the products and the services, then they would leave the store and purchase something online. Today we've reversed that. We're inviting our shoppers to go online first and then to come into the store. And in fact, we've simplified it. If they're in the store, they can even purchase it online in the store and research it in the store by having Wi-Fi capability. This is the technology that we need to integrate, not just in our stores, but across our shopping malls as well. There's some wonderful examples of integrating this technology. For example, Burberry has seamlessly integrated technology into their in-store experience in their flagship store on Regent Street in London. They have interactive signage which greets you when you walk into the store and displays key points in the building that you may be interested in. The employees carry iPads and on the iPads is information about your past purchases, your preferences, and sales that might be of interest to you. Also, lots of the merchandise has an RFID chip embedded in it, which when you walk in front of a mirror with the chip, it will show you a video of how the product was made and it will suggest other products that will match that garment or that product that you're bringing to look at in the mirror. These are very interesting technological advances which enhance the shopping experience. And it's not just at the high end that this is taking place. It's also taking place in the middle consumer markets as well. For example, Walmart and Uphold are starting to roll out scan-it-yourself technologies in their stores using iPhone technology. And iPhone has, uh, then Uphold has found that shoppers who use this scan-it-yourself technology typically spend 10% more in the store than shoppers who don't use it. Adopting this technology and philosophy appears to be critical, given now what we know about consumer behavior. Another key component was some research done by Accenture last February, and they found out that by and large, consumers are tired of online shopping. Consumers are looking for something else and they're looking for that experience. This is the opportunity for retailers and shopping centers alike, brick and mortar stores, to deliver on that promise of greater experience. Retailers are even taking it a little a step further, using their physical space to provide product and inventory information that can't be done online, and also creating an in-store experience that ties the product and services to things that are sold in the store. Williams in Sonoma sells cooking products. They provide cooking classes in their stores. And not surprisingly, everything you learn to cook on, you can also purchase in the stores. And they're not alone. Other food retailers are following the same model and sporting goods stores are following the same model of creating an in-store experience, combining the products with the experience in the store. As the in-store model is being tailored to better match online's convenience, it's also really no surprise that today e-tailers are looking to open physical stores. We're seeing e-tailers like Bobble Bar, Boston Proper, Warby Parker, Tummies to Teens, Just Fab, Frank and Oak. They're all moving from online into physical store spaces. One of the best examples of this is Athleta, that was an online only retailer of athletic sportswear. They began opening stores and their so overall sales have soared. By the end of this year, they'll have over 100 stores. Another example of this is a retailer called Bonobos. Bonobos began as an online only retailer selling men's trousers. And to enhance their sales, they opened what they called guide shops. Not where you go in and pick up the merchandise, but where you go and pick out the merchandise. You can try on the sizes, you can check the fabric, you can check the colors, and then you purchase the item online. And as the CEO said of Bonobos said, to those who say we don't sell in our stores, I have to correct them. We actually do sell a lot in our stores. We don't, just don't fulfill in our stores. And the most interesting announcement to me to come out last week 
was the announcement that the Uber retailer Amazon is opening its first physical store. They announced plans to have their first store opened in New York City by the end of the year. And the purpose of this is they recognize that shoppers want to touch and see and take home their products before they purchase them. This issue of instant fulfillment has lessened a little bit in the internet era as shoppers have gotten used to waiting to have a product delivered by a messenger service or a delivery service. However, some shopping center owners have taken this into their own hands. A group of mall owners in the United States formed a partnership and using a company called Delive to provide same-day delivery of products that are sold in their shopping malls but that may be purchased online by consumers. And the model is relatively simple. The consumer makes the purchase online. The product is prepared at the local store in the shopping mall. And using a model not unlike Uber, they identify a D-Live driver who will pick up the product from the shopping mall and deliver it to the consumer the same day, either to their home, their place of work, or to another location, wherever the consumer might prefer this. What this means, and this is important for our industry, is that today stores can double as distribution centers. And given the number of stores and shopping centers and their proximity to the consumers, it's very possible that the shopping center could become the most efficient and most environmentally friendly distribution channel for online shopping and provide near instant gratification at its quickest and its finest. In Europe, this same concept is being tried out. Multi-Malls is trying a D-Live concept at its 13 malls in Portugal. Shoppers go online and select from about 150 different brands that are offered by the mall's tenants, and then their purchases are either delivered to their home or their office. So far, participants include retailers like Apple, Boss, Canon, Chanel, and Samsung. Even brick-and-mortar retailer Walmart Technology Google, Giants, and eBay have all begun to look at this instant fulfillment combining online with physical retailing. A wonderful example of a combination between eBay, an online-only retailer, and a shopping center owner, Westfield, is the concept of their digital storefront. This is one example of the digital storefront that's in a, shopping cent a Westfield center in New Jersey coming out of the Westfield Labs concept. Originally conceived to cover a vacant storefront, this now is turned into a profit center. Shoppers walk up to the wall, they select products from the wall, they purchase the products, and those products are delivered to the mall within an hour. The retailer has to have no physical presence whatsoever in the shopping mall, yet they have an ability and a presence to be able to sell to the consumers in the shopping mall. This omni-channel approach that we're witnessing really is a response to the changing consumer desires. Those consumers today want what they want, when they want it, and where they want it. Truly, the consumer remains king. And our recent survey showed that almost half, 48%, of all consumers have ordered something online and they've picked it up in a store which is a way to integrate the two technologies, physical and virtual retailing. And as previously noted, over a third of shoppers use the internet to do research online before they make the purchase. And also, over a third have purchased something online but returned it to a store. In the past, we used to put the returns department in the most inconvenient lo and undesirable location. And we discourage returns in our stores. We didn't want people to return products. Now we found that purchases made online, when they're returned in a physical store, for every dollar of returns on that same trip, the shopper makes $1.17 in purchases. So by facilitating returns, we're actually driving incremental sales, and retailers are moving their return departments up to the front of the store and to more convenient locations. And the good news for us at the end of the day in our industry is that in-store experience is still the most sought after. Three quarters, 78% of consumers prefer to shop in stores. 
And when we asked them why is it, overwhelmingly they said it's to touch and try on the merchandise before I buy something. It's that relationship with the merchandise, it's the experience with the merchandise, something that can't be done online. This is going to continue to be the case as we add more service businesses, food options, entertainment, social interaction-based experiences to our shopping centers, and of course, additional technological advancements. I'm thrilled at some of the changes that we're seeing in our industry, and thrilled to see how our industry is advancing and embracing technology and becoming a leader in the forefront of consumer technology and consumer change. The future looks brighter than ever for our industry. Its embracement of the consumer needs, its embracement of the technology, its combination of experience, tourism, entertainment are driving our future. I congratulate all of you for spending the time to be here today. And following up on a comment that David made about meet somebody new and share a business card, I want to share with you another concept that I hope you share your knowledge with one another. The founder of ICSC once pointed out that if two people came together, each bringing with them one dollar in their pocket, and they exchanged that dollar with each other, they both left with just a dollar in their pocket. But if they both came in with an idea, and they exchanged the ideas, they both left with two ideas in their minds. I encourage you to share and exchange your ideas. Thank you for having me here. Congratulations on 20 years. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Thank you very much indeed for not just setting the scene and giving some global perspective, but giving some real depth and insight there. Thanks very much indeed. Really appreciate that. Lots more of that to come later on today. Coming up in an hour or so, we've got our panel discussion. In fact, Mohammed Alawi will be back on stage with a fabulous, fabulous lineup of panelists from souks to moles, what to expect in the next 20 years. Before that, though, we, um, we take out our crystal balls and we take a sneak peek into the future because our next speaker is a retail futurist. He is a funny, engaging, and insightful speaker. And I know that not just because that's what it says on his speaker biography, but I know it because yesterday morning he was a guest on my radio show. And I've got to tell you this, if you're a guest on a TV show or radio show, in this age of tweeting and social media, whether you like it or not, it's like being on American Idol. People will vote. They send in messages saying, who's this idiot? Get him off. This is nonsense. Or they send in messages, and you don't ask them to, but they do it anyway, saying, this guy's great. Where can we get a podcast of this interview? What's the name of his book? Where is he speaking here in Dubai? Can I hire him to come and work for my organization? We got the latter response, let me tell you, when this guy was on the radio show yesterday morning. He is the author of a book, Retail Revival, Reimagining Business for the New Age of Consumerism. He works as a consultant for many of the world's powerhouse brands, Walmart, Sony, Disney, you name it, they are on his roster. And before that, he spent 20 years or so working in retail, including a leadership position with one of New York's most iconic retailers. I'd love to steal a number of his lines and tease ahead to what he has to share with you, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let him deliver that to you in his own inimitable way. Will you please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker for today, Douglas Stevens. Thanks, Doug. Well, good morning. What an honor to be here. Thank you very, very much, and I mean that very sincerely. It's a, it's a true privilege and an honor to be with you today, and certainly thank you to David and, and everyone with the association for bringing me here. Uh, just before I get started, though, I'd like to do a quick survey just so that I can get sort of a temperature of, of the group and, and understand your experience. So by show of applause, clap your hands if you've been in the retail industry for more than 10 years. Clap your hands. Wow, a lot of experience. Now, clap your hands if you've been in the industry for more than 20 years. 30? 75? 
No, nobody, okay, all right, good. How many, last, last question, how many of you have ever been shopping before in your life? Clap your hands if you've been shopping. <laughs> Most of you, good, okay. Well, if you've ever been shopping before and, and you've enjoyed that experience, I'm afraid I have to start off with a little bit of bad news. And that is that retail is dead. Thank you very much. No, actually, don't get angry with me, that's not my opinion. That is the opinion of this gentleman. Now, you, you may not know who this is, uh, but th this gentleman's name is Mark Andreessen. And if, if you remember, how many of you remember Netscape Navigator? Okay, so back in the, in the, the dawn of the internet, Netscape Navigator. So, Mark Andreessen was one of the co-founders of Netscape Navigator. And he went on to become a very important uh, venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. He's one half of Andreessen Horowitz out in the valley. And they're invested in just about every major internet property you can imagine. Facebook, Pinterest, the list goes on and on and on. And he was interviewed recently in a Wired Magazine article where he said, point blank, retail is dead. In fact, he said, software is eating retail. And in fact, he went even further than that, and he said software is eating the world. Every business, in his opinion, is either going to be disrupted or potentially eradicated by software and technology. Now, as you can imagine, there was sort of this, you know, gasp of, of horror in the industry when he said this, and analysts began to argue back and forth on one side or the other of his point. Some people said, well, it's absolutely true. When you look at what's happening, it makes perfect sense. We're going to need less and less retail space until eventually we need none, and everything will come to us via the internet. Other people said, that's ridiculous. You know, we're always going to need physical brick and mortar stores. People are going to want to shop in physical spaces. I decided, rather than getting passionate about it, I would just sort of look at the statistics that someone like Andreessen would be looking at when he made a statement like that. And I have to admit, the statistics are pretty compelling. When you figure that in 2013, $1.2 trillion globally in e-commerce. Now, if the absolute number of $1.2 trillion doesn't astonish you, which it may not, what should astonish you is the growth of that number. Because what that represents is a 19% year-on-year increase. So a pretty significant increase. So when you do the math on that, it doesn't take very long before, you know, 10 years hence, maybe 20, 30, 40% of everything we buy could potentially be coming to us via the internet. To put a point on that, over the last holiday season in North America, on Cyber Monday, Amazon was clocking in at 426 transactions per second. Now, I know we all have busy days, but that's a really busy day. You know, that's about 37 million transactions per day. So a really, really significant volume of transactions. In fact, the biggest challenge over the last holiday season for e-commerce was not getting people to buy things over the internet. They're doing lots of that. It was actually getting the things that they're buying to them in a reasonable period of time. So in order to fulfill those orders, Amazon and other companies are, you know, buying startups that provide digital lock boxes. They're uh, delivering within an hour within major cities. Jeff Bezos at Amazon is talking about drone delivery of packages, you know. And in fact, the German post office beat him to it. The German post office is now delivering packages via drone helicopters. Google is experimenting with driverless vehicles quite successfully. So you know the courier industry must be looking very closely at that as well. Right? So the volume of e-commerce distribution now is such that it's difficult for courier companies and delivery companies to catch up. In fact, Amazon has recently applied for a patent for a thing they're calling predictive shipping. Now what that means is that they will ship you something before you order it potentially before you even know you want it, they'll ship it to you. And they'll ship it a little closer to you so that when you decide you want it and you, and you pull the trigger on the order, they can make sure that they get it to you right away, potentially within a half an hour to an hour. 
So now people are saying, when does this when does this technology curve begin to flatten out, begin to mature? When are we going to start to see the decline of online sales? And I think it's actually just the opposite. I think we're going to see a new evolution of online sales very soon. And the reason I say that is because of technologies like this. I think when you look at it, despite Amazon's success, Amazon is basically just a digital catalog. It's like taking an old catalog and digitizing it. The shopping experience really didn't change. But when you look at technologies like virtual reality, like these virtual reality goggles from Oculus Rift, which was just purchased by Facebook, all of a sudden now the shopping experience online could become quite immersive. All of a sudden somebody potentially could be sitting on their sofa in North America and shopping in the Mall of Dubai virtually without ever leaving their home. We're also going to see, well, if you, know, if you think that that's um, you know, way off in the future, I'll just show you something very quickly. This was a program that Marriott Hotels actually launched as a promotion uh, for their hotel chain, and they used virtual reality. So I'll show you what that looked like. Would you like to go to London right now? Let's do it! Jaws would drop the entire time. Oh no, I don't want to look no more. Oh my god. Oh my god. He looks down, he looks up, it's like incredible. Yeah, like all the way around. It feels like you're on the edge of a giant building. It felt extremely real. Like, it, like, it felt like I could go and like grab the cocktail from the table. Did that make you want to plan a trip? Right now. Let's go. <laughs> let's take that. Let's go, let's go. So imagine a new evolution of shopping where all of a sudden, just by putting on these goggles, I could have an immersive experience. Now we also talked about the, the desire of consumers to touch and feel what you have in store. And that stores are you know, one of the few places that you can do that. However, technology is also stepping in there to make it possible to potentially feel things through your computer. This is a technology out of the University of Pennsylvania called haptography whereby just by running a stylus across the pad, you're actually replicating or you're feeling the tactile feel of denim, as though your fingers are running across denim. It's remarkable. We're also going to see an evolution of e-commerce towards it becoming much, much more contextual. Rather than a consumer having to make a conscious trip to an online destination, products are going to start to come to us automatically. Google is making an effort to connect our online behavior with our offline shopping behavior. This is an example of a program they have called Google Now, where whatever you search for on Google, you will get notifications about when you're in the physical world near those products. So if you searched for this particular blender online, when you're near it in the real world, you'll get a notification that'll say, the store that sells that product is just around the corner. You can go get it from there. So where does all this lead us to? Well, um, there's a really good quote here by, Kurt, uh, by Ray Kurzweil who says that in the future, it's not going to be about us going and searching for something online. It's going to be that these search engines are constantly working in the background and predicting the things that we're likely to want. That it's tying together our calendar, our social behavior, our past purchases, our preferences as, as consumers, and bringing us options at all times. And that's increasingly possible because we're becoming much, much more connected. Right now there are about five billion connected devices in the world. Most of the things that you're probably, you probably have in your pockets or your hands right now, mobile devices, laptops, tablets, etc. But over the next 10 years, we're going to see that number grow to about 50 billion connected devices. And these will be many things that you don't expect. These may be pills that we're ingesting that are talking to our physicians or our healthcare providers. They may be uh, technological pieces that we're wearing. We're seeing the rise of wearables with Apple launching its smartwatch. So we can expect these things to start to mainstream. Our houses will become connected. Our cars certainly will become connected. Many, many, many things that we never predicted. Our appliances potentially will be placing orders with retailers on our behalf. 
You know, all, all we'll have to do as a consumer is approve that order. And all of this is making it infinitely easier for brands and manufacturers to connect directly with, re with consumers. Connecting directly as opposed to going through retail. Because if we're honest about it, retail is a level of friction, isn't it, between the maker of something and the consumer. It's been a necessary level of friction, but it's a level of friction nonetheless. These connections that I'm talking about are also going to make it easier for consumers potentially to share things. We're already seeing the rise of the sharing economy, where people are sharing cars, they're sharing their houses, they're sharing potentially even their skills with one another, all through this level of connection now that we have, which is quite remarkable. And lastly, technology is even making it possible for us to produce our own things. The rise of 3D printing, where I can sit on my sofa at home and make a variety of things that I might have gone to the store to buy only a short time ago. So what is all this doing? What is all this technological disruption doing? Well, it's, it's uh, causing category killers like Walmart which only a short time ago were like the Roman Legion, you know, dominating the, certainly North America and much of the world. And it's causing them now to try a number of different things to try and find the new level of relevance in this new digital age. They're trying express stores in downtown centers, on-campus stores at universities. They're buying mobile startups, social startups, combining them under Walmart labs to try and find new relevance in this digital age. They're trying to take their large stores and put them in downtown centers because they recognize that that's where the growth is. They're pushing consumers to dot-com stores at the holidays to try and instill that behavior in consumers and get them shopping on walmart.com. And then ultimately, they're trying to create an online marketplace not unlike Amazon itself. So, we come back to our friend Mark. And Although there's a lot of evidence in his favor, I still believe that he's wrong. And I'll tell you why I say that. It's because I believe whether we're talking about the Roman marketplace in 400 BC, or whether we're talking about the modern shopping complex, I don't believe that we shop purely for acquisition. I don't believe that we shop just so we can go and get more stuff, more things. Sometimes that might be the case, but I think there's more to it. And I say that because for the same reason, I don't think that we go to a fine restaurant. Would you agree with me? You don't go to a fine restaurant purely for calorie intake, right? It's not just to keep your body alive. You go because the chef is well known, the restaurant is beautiful, the food is beautifully prepared, it's the smells, the sounds, the ambiance, and it all combines into a remarkable experience. It's the same reason that celebrities go shopping. A celebrity like Angelina Jolie could have anything she wants delivered to her, right to her hotel suite. But she goes out in public because she needs to. Because we all need to do that. There's something social about shopping. It's the same reason we camp outside Apple stores for four days and four nights to get a mobile device that's an eighth of an inch longer than the one you own already. You know, it's a social behavior. It's a social ritual that we go through. At certain times of the year, I know you've probably seen these television reports coming from North America, shopping becomes almost a blood sport where we see this going on in stores. People fighting over things in stores. You know, we get very, very emotionally vested in this. And as we heard earlier, if online is really the way all shopping is going, then why are we seeing Google, eBay, and now Amazon talking about opening physical stores? And I believe it's because they recognize that you really can't fully actualize as a brand unless you can build a physical and emotional connection with a consumer. I think it's as simple as that. So that's my defense of physical retail and why I think we're going to need it into the future for some time to come. 
However, I will also say that everything about how we shop, where we shop, and even why we shop is changing. And it's changing very, very dramatically. I think it's changed significantly in North America, and I think that change is going to come here even faster than it happened in North America. And I also believe it's not just a, a cycle or a blip or a temporary bump on the way back to the th way things used to be. I think it's a long-term change. I sort of liken it to a crash into the end of an era. A long era that in North America stretched back to the post-Second World War, where things were relatively constant and stable. And the hallmark traits of that old era were, were these things, I think. Mass media was dependably effective. You may not have known what a consumer would do when they saw your advertisement, but you could say with relative certainty who would see your advertisement, how many people would see your advertising. Within that, brands and retailers were the ones that controlled the path to purchase. They were the ones that controlled the information, the access to product along that path to purchase. And the physical store was really just a product delivery mechanism. It was a ship-to point for manufacturers and a pickup point for consumers. And all of it worked beautifully according to this model, the purchase funnel. All you had to do was put lots and lots of advertising in the top of the funnel, and then miraculously, that would translate into repeat business at the bottom of the funnel. It worked like magic, and it would drive consumers to your store, so long as you had the brand they were looking for or the product that they were looking for, you could be wildly successful. But now the purchase funnel looks like this. This is basically the consumer's decision matrix. It can start anywhere and it can end anywhere. They may discover you on Facebook. They may discover your brand on Facebook or your shopping center on Facebook. That may take them to your mobile app. From your mobile app, that might take them to your physical center and that might take them back to your website. You don't know. You have no idea where they're going to start and where they're going to end. And that makes it very, very difficult to market to that fast-moving market of consumers that are going in a hundred different directions at once. Where do you place your advertising to be most effective? You don't know. It makes it very, very tough. And within this whole landscape, this new consumer landscape, selection has been completely redefined. I remember very clearly in the late 1980s, early 1990s, going into my first big box electronics store, first sort of hypermarket electronics store, and I was absolutely astonished at the selection of merchandise. I think they had about 50 different varieties of television sets in the store. It was remarkable. But now if you go to Amazon and you search televisions, you get half a million results back. Half a million results. And Amazon will actually help you find just the result for you. They'll give you a variety of prices. You can read reviews. You can look at alternate products help you to tailor down all those selections to the one thing that is best for you. And all of this, of course, is being accelerated by what? Well, probably by what you have in your pocket, your mobile device. And I know you're going to see lots of things. You're going to see lots of charts and graphs that show you how mobile adoption is, is just continues to go like this. And I know in this region, in Dubai, mobile adoption is astronomical. But I'll show you visually, because I think it'll drive the, the point home a little bit better. This is a picture of St. Peter's Square in 2005 during the, the uh, funeral of Pope John Paul II from a very, very specific vantage point in the square. And if you look really closely, you can see this one little flip phone sticking up out of the audience, probably taking a two megapixel picture of something. Now, I'm going to shuttle you forward in time to 2013 from the exact same vantage point during the inauguration of Pope Francis. <laughs> Isn't that astonishing? Right? In that short period of time, we really and truly have become a mobile-first world. 
And what is the impact of that? That's the question we have to ask ourselves as retailers. What is the true impact of that? And I think the impact of that is that it has now put the consumer in control. The, they say the internet changed everything, but I don't believe that. I think mobile has changed everything because now we have that universe of selection and choice where we need it most, and that is in the store, at the shelf as we're making that decision. And just to sort of show you that level of access that I'm talking about, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you a really quick little story. I, d I do a web series, a uh, series of, of short little webisodes for eBay. And it's called The Future in Store. You can find episodes on YouTube if you're interested. And it talks about technologies that are changing retail. And the first episode that we shot, we shot in New York City. And, um, they, were, they wanted at eBay to debut this app called eBay Now. And they said, we'd like you to, to you know, use the app. And the way it works is you go online, you can shop about 100 different retailers using the app, purchase the product you want, and we'll deliver it to you wherever you are in the five boroughs of New York City in under an hour. Now, I know some of you are from New York, and you will probably agree with me that that is a very, very difficult task. It can take a half an hour to go two blocks in a cab in New York City, and they said they could deliver in under an hour. So I thought, you know what, we'll give this a try and see. We'll pressure test it. So I went to Madison Square Park, right in the heart of New York, sat down on a park bench in New York City, and ordered a New York Yankees baseball cap. And Within about two minutes after I paid for the cap, I got a notification on my mobile device that said that my courier had been dispatched. They were going to go get my product and that they would locate me. Once they had gotten the product, they'd locate me in, the, in my destination or my, my proximity and they would meet up with me. We had another camera crew follow the courier as they were dispatched and made their way over to Macy's to get the product. Long story short, 42 minutes later, my cap was delivered to me on a park bench in New York City. To me, that completely redefines convenience, right? That has completely changed the game. And what it means to me is that now the store, our, our definition of the store is everywhere. The store is everywhere. It can be in a tweet because somebody has put a buy button now on a tweet, allowing me with one keystroke to buy what I want. It can be on a poster. You know, the store now is a poster. Not an ad telling me to go to a store, but the, but the ad has become the store. It can be a magazine. Every page of Harper's Bazaar magazine now is basically a store. You can buy directly from the pages of that magazine using your mobile device. YouTube videos have become the store. Brands are taking YouTube channels where I can learn about products and I can also shop them. I can price compare and make my purchase right away, right from the YouTube video. And in fact, even your competitors' locations now can be your store. Here's an example from China. This is a grocery retailer called Yihaudian. And Yihaudian created 1,000 virtual stores last year in China, 1,000 virtual stores. This is what their virtual store looks like when you look at it through your mobile device. As long as you're in the right spot and you look through your mobile device, you can see their virtual stores. This is what it looks like when you're looking at it through your mobile. Now, what they did, just to, to add insult to injury, is they went to um, a location where Carrefour has a, a major store, and they put their virtual store right in front of it. You know, just, just to be nasty. So, what does all this mean? You know, we know that all this stuff is happening, but what does it really mean? And what does it mean for you? And what will it mean for you? Because as I know, you know, Dubai and, and the region have had tremendous success with physical spaces. And I'm sure you're going to continue for a long time to have that success. But what does it mean in the future for you? I think there's a significant transition happening and I think it's historic. And I think it is really going to change the nature of shopping and certainly the nature of, of shopping center development. And it is this, media in all of its forms is becoming 
the store. It's becoming sort of now our new definition of what the store is. And the store, in turn, is becoming media. And I would argue, maybe the most powerful form of media you have. Now, what does that mean? Because it sounds kind of confusing, right? Media is the store, and the store is media. This is what it means. If you look at the old role of media, if, if you ran an ad or, or a series of ads, the purpose of those ads was to do three things. Tell me about the brand, let me know something about the brand, interest me in some products or services, and then ultimately drive me to a destination to buy those products or services, right? That was a successful piece of media if it did those three things. But now, as we said, media is no longer necessarily driving me to a store, it is the store, whether it's a magazine, a video, smart TV. And as we become more connected, and as we become more embedded in technology, this is only going to increase. So what does that mean for the store? That's the question, right? What does all this mean for physical stores? Well, I think, it's a, an, again, it's a historic transition because stores now have to move from being in the business of distributing products first and foremost to being in the business of distributing experiences first and foremost. Experiences now are really the product. And the physical products will come along for the ride within those experiences. So what does that mean? What does the store of the future look like? Well, I think the store of the future is going to be less about going someplace just to take something home. And I think it's going to be potentially more about going someplace to make something, to be an active participant in the process of bringing something to life or co-creating, whether that's making a computer at Fujitsu, whether that's uh, you know, making and customizing your own road racing cycle using your own telemetry, or whether it's putting Instagram photos on your Adidas running shoes, which you can do now, your own Instagram photos right on your shoes. Right? This is going to be, I think, the nature of why we want to go to a store in the first place, is to have an experience. So it's going to be less about commodity products, less about just filling boxes with products, and much, much more about the production value that we put around those products. And it's not always the big brands. Yes, Burberry has done a beautiful job with their Regent Street store. It costs them millions of dollars, of course. Bonobos, another, as, as you mentioned, uh, another great online brand that has created an offline experience. But little stores like Pave Barcelona, it's a little road racing cycling shop in Barcelona, Spain, has done a beautiful job of creating a wonderful store that people love going to because there's an experience in store that you can have beyond just buying the product. I think the future of retail is going to be less about assortment planning, you know, trying to get just the right products in store and turn that inventory quickly. And it's going to be more about assortment spanning. It's going to be more about having every product imaginable for the consumer to look at, potentially to try on, and then order online, even if that's right in the store. This is a, a store called Sneaker Boy in Australia where you can choose from hundreds and hundreds of different sneakers, but they don't stock anything in the store. You try it on, if you like it, you order it online, and it's delivered to you the next day. Retail will become a lot more channel agnostic. Right? We will either choose what is on the shelf, and if we don't like that, we'll have the ability to order directly from online while we're in the store, potentially with a screen that sits right beside the merchandise. I think we're going to also need a lot fewer sales clerks. Right now we have a lot of people in retail whose responsibility is to say hello to the customer, to answer any questions about the products, to check on a price or inventory levels on products. I think we're going to need a lot fewer of these people. And we're going to see a lot more of this. We're going to see a lot more artificial intelligence and technology coming in to replace retail workers. Now, I think this is, just, this is just simply a fact. It's going to happen. This is a product called Watson, the Watson computer. Has anyone heard of Watson? So some of you have. 
Okay, so IBM created the Watson computer. It's actually named after the founder of IBM. And it's an artificial intelligence program that is designed to be smarter than us. Now, if you've never seen Watson, I'll show you Watson in action. Uh, alternate meaning is 400. Four-letter word for the iron fitting on the hoof of a horse or a card dealing box in a casino. Watson. What is it, Shoot. You are right. And any time you feel the pain, hey, this guy, refrain. Don't carry the world upon your shoulders. Watson. Who is Jude? Yes. Milorad Kavic almost upset this man's perfect 2008 Olympics, losing to him by one hundredth of a second. Watson. Who is Michael Phelps? Yes. You just need a nap. You don't have this sleep disorder that can make sufferers nod off while standing up. Watson. What is narcolepsy? You are right. And with that, you move to 36,681. So what the video doesn't tell you is that the two humans in there were actually the two highest scoring Jeopardy champions of all time. And they were absolutely made to look foolish by virtue of Watson. And what was going on there, I don't know all the technology behind it, but basically what was going on is Watson was understanding natural speech pattern. So as the question was being asked, Watson was already picking out keywords and calculating potential answers by going up to cloud databases, a number of different databases, finding potential answers, formulating them, and then cross-comparing them for their likelihood of being correct, and then delivering the answer. And Watson was doing all of that before the other two guys could even push their buzzers. That's how fast it was happening. Now, I also know for a fact that IBM is looking at Watson as being the future of IBM, basically. This is their major investment. They want to make sure that this is in hospitality, in retail, and even in healthcare. They see applications for this. When you look at robotics, robotics is actually being used in stores now to create autonomous stores, stores that don't even have any employees in them. This is a store called Hointer in Seattle. And the way Hointer works is a little different than other apparel shops. You walk in and all the clothes are hanging so that you can see them. Not stacked up, but hanging out so you can see all the different kinds. There's a tag on each pair of jeans in this store. And with their mobile app, you simply scan the tag to get information about the product and find out which sizes are available. You pick the size that you want, you push the button, and the size that you've picked is delivered robotically to the fitting room. It comes down a chute into the fitting room. You go into the fitting room, you try on the what you like. If you like it, you can simply buy it directly from a swipe card in the fitting room and you leave. You never have to, you, if you don't want to, you never have to talk with anyone and you don't have to um, have any employees necessarily in that store. Now, what is the likelihood of all this happening? Right? What's the likelihood of technology actually displacing people in the retail industry? There was a study done out of Oxford University Oxford University recently that said that there's actually a 92% chance that this is going to happen within the next 10 years, a 92% probability. So what I think is I think smart brands, I think smart developers are going to start to look at this technology for application in their centers or in their stores, and they're going to start to proactively plan for it. How can we introduce this? How can it be effective? And furthermore, how can we redeploy our best people in other ways to make the customer's experience even more exciting and more gratifying? Because, you know, I don't want to paint a picture that there won't be people in retail anymore, because I believe there will be. But they're going to have vastly different roles than they have today. There'll be people who absolutely love the products that they sell and they're enthusiastic users of those products. There'll be people who um, you know, are, are just passionate about their brand that they sell and, and, and so enthusiastic about it, they want to co-create with customers, to do demonstrations in stores, to bring the products to life. All right, we're doing her eyes. And all of that is gonna help us 
connect with this generation. We've all heard about Generation Y, the most connected generation on earth, right? The generation that has never not known the internet. All of this will help us to bridge over to that generation because there's actually some misconceptions about this generation. Everyone says that, well, they're so connected, they don't like stores. They don't like shopping in stores. They just want to shop on their mobile devices. Surveys actually show, yes, they are incredibly connected. They're in, in enormous adopters of mobile technology. We know that. But other surveys often show that they actually love shopping in physical stores. Contrary to popular belief, they're not buying everything on their mobile devices or online. They regard shopping as entertainment. The problem is, in a lot of cases, we're boring them as an industry. We're creating centers that aren't necessarily exciting for them. So we need to make sure that people aren't, you know, compelled to use their mobile devices or go to sleep in our centers. We need to make them exciting by introducing technology that can create surprise and delight in those stores. Mirrors that can help us try things on before we buy them without ever stepping into a fitting room. Mannequins that potentially talk to our mobile devices and tell our devices what they're wearing so that we can better and more easily shop for those things. Touch screens outside the stores so that if we don't care to go in or if the store is closed, we can still shop. To be much more unexpected, we've heard about pop-up retail. The effectiveness of pop-up retail, I think it's really a remarkable way to be unexpected, to surprise consumers and to potentially be somewhere for a very short period of time to capitalize on an opportunity where there's a lot of traffic or where there are a lot of consumers gathered. And we can be very creative with that. And in terms of connecting on social media, because we, I know that a lot of you uh, are certainly looking at social strategies, how to bring people to your centers, I don't think it's all just about getting likes. It's not just about having consumers like us on Facebook. Because the fact of the matter is, statistically, when consumers like us on Facebook and they make a post to a brand, 95% of the time the brand doesn't even respond. So we go out and we say to people, hey, like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, and then when they talk to us, we're not responding to them. However, I like what brands like CNA are doing. CNA is a Spanish retailer, and this is something they did in their stores in Brazil, where they were actually taking likes for products on their Facebook page and beaming them down in real time to these digital hangers in the store so that a consumer could actually see which products were most popular. They could start to use the social validation as a navigation means in store. American Apparel took it a step further, saying if you scan this picture of the product on the shelf edge using your mobile device, you can retrieve reviews, you can retrieve videos, product information, all the things that you're accustomed to seeing online when you're making a purchase you can now see as you stand in front of the shelf. I also think it's important to look at the ways we can use technology to take friction out of the shopping experience. Because there is a lot of friction still in shopping. You know, things like waiting in line for your purchase, waiting in line to pay. Things like getting to the store or the mall just after it's closed and not being able to shop. The fitting room experience where you have to try on clothes and then, you know, you try on the wrong size and you have to go and find the right size. All of these things make shopping sometimes less enjoyable. So we can use technology like Kroger Grocery Stores has in North America. Kroger used video analytics to take the lineups at its cash registers from four minutes on average to 26 seconds. Just by analyzing, using video analytics and analyzing where it needed to deploy staff most effectively from one moment to the next. We heard about the Westfield malls and the great stuff that they've done with these digital storefronts, which in essence would make it possible for someone to shop the mall after the mall is closed. If every store had, had also a digital storefront that becomes an interface for e-commerce, the store and the mall could be 24 hours. And the fitting room experience can be transformed simply by putting a screen in the, in the fitting room that allows me then to call for help 
to ask for a new size or a different color of the garment that I have in the fitting room and I don't have to leave sort of uncomfortably. So retail in general, I think, is going to become a lot less about just conversion, you know, getting consumers into your store and converting them, making them buy, and it's going to be a lot more about creating converts for your brand, getting people excited about your brand and willing to buy from you anywhere across any of these devices, regardless of where they are and what they want. So what does all that mean? Well, if, if consumers are buying in different places across devices and platforms, not only from stores, it really means that we can't just measure stores in the same way anymore. You know, it, it surprises me that given all the technological change that we've seen just in the last 20 years, that we're still measuring stores the same way we did in the 1800s. You know, sales per square foot, sales per hour, sales per associate, profit per square foot, all these measures that we've used traditionally, we continue to use today. But, and I'm not suggesting that we throw these away completely. I'm not suggesting that we don't look at these metrics anymore because of course they're important. But we also have the capability now to look at a whole new series of metrics to really tell us what is going on in a store, to tell us what's going on in a shopping center, to track consumers through that center, to heat map where they're going, where they're not going, which areas of the center they're interacting with, with which are the most popular retailers and which are the least, and measure the center in a completely different way. So, we come full circle back to Mark Andreessen and his question, software, does it eat retail? No, no it doesn't. Because retail is just becoming what I call fidgetal. It's a perfect blend of digital and physical and it's coming together. It has come together in North America and I believe it's going to come together very, very quickly here because technolo technology is moving exponentially faster than it ever has before. And it's going to continue to do so over the next 10 years. So I'd recommend you start looking at these issues now. You have a really unique opportunity, I think, in the little that I've learned about the region since I've been here, I think you are really uniquely poised for a tremendous opportunity to capitalize on a lot of the things that I'm talking about now to start to experiment with a lot of these technologies. You've had tremendous success with physical retail. I mean, I was at the Dubai Mall yesterday and it was just astonishing. You know, and I think you can, you can continue to leverage that success to now push into new territory into this omni-channel world that we're talking about. So keep in mind a few things. If there is anything that software does eat, I think it's average. Anything that's average. If you look at businesses that have succumbed to the internet, by and large, it's not because technology killed them, it was because they were giving an average experience in the first place. So you always want to be at that level of being absolutely remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. Every customer that leaves your shopping center or your store has to have that look on their face when they leave. Then you'll know you've done a good job. Because in this world of one-click satisfaction, nobody really needs what you sell anymore. And that's a really hard thing to hear. And it's not just what you sell, it's what I sell, it's what everybody sells. Nobody really needs what we sell, but they do need how we sell it. That's really the magic. But in order to take the next step, you have to stop competing. And I know that sounds crazy. I know you'll probably think I'm, I'm insane for saying that. You have to stop competing and you have to start sort of reimagining what it is that you do. Completely reimagine it with this new reality in mind. Because the, the companies out there now that are disrupting in every industry are not companies from within their industries. If you look at uh, Warby Parker, for example, is a company that is now disrupting the optical market in North America. They had no experience in that market and they're shaking it up. Square is shaking up the payments market in North America and abroad as well. And again, no experience in their industry at all. Airbnb 
the vacation rental sharing site is going to put more people in rooms this year than Hilton hotels. And they are six years old. No experience in their industry. And Tesla automobiles doing the same thing for automobiles and dealership models, changing and disrupting with no experience in the industry. So the competition is not who you think it is. The competition is really coming from outside. So reimagine what you do. And start to try, if, if, if you can, answer some of these really big questions. Questions, how can we connect the shopping experience in our centers? How can every customer who walks into the center feel like the experience in that center was customized just for them? Not for everybody. They had a different experience than everyone else because it was customized for them. How can that experience in that center be contextualized so that things just appear to be happening sort of magically just for that shopper? These are the questions we want to answer. How can we completely reinvent the shopping experience? Completely reinvent it. And then ultimately, how can we start to explore now with new revenue models? You know, maybe looking beyond percentage rent you know, how can we start to, to experiment with treating retail like advertising space, perhaps? You know, looking at it as on a cost per impression sort of uh, a model, uh, rather than a cost per sale sort of uh, a model. So, really exploring this new territory. And when we find these new ideas, it's important to act really quickly. You know, when we explore this, uh, this new exponential sort of ground, it's important that we go first. When you find a great, I, you know, I sort of say my benchmark for a great idea is that if, if it doesn't make you nervous, it's probably not a good idea. It's probably not really innovative if it doesn't make you a little uneasy. And when you find those great ideas, go first. You have no time now to go second, to wait to see if it works for someone else before you go. You have to go first. There's a, a strong correlation now between brands that go first in their markets and brands that succeed. So go first and you'll be fine most of the time. <laughs> Not going to lie, sometimes it won't work out. However, as I always say, it's one penguin out of how many, right? It's just research and development. But if you do go first, if you are the first to capitalize, you're the one that gets the reward. That's the prize. Now, before I close off, I just want to say one thing. Uh, there's probably about 300 people here. Generally speaking, about 20% of you right now are feeling enthusiastic about the future. You're feeling like, yes, okay, this is great. We're going to pioneer into new space now create a totally different shopping model, and you're very excited about that. About 60% of you are probably just sort of maybe still digesting breakfast, you know, the coffee is just sinking in, and you're going to think about this a little bit before you make a decision. And then 20% of you at the bottom are maybe feeling a bit like this, you know? Like, we just really can't change, you know? I know what you're saying, but, you know, I just don't think it's going to work, right? Well. I'll leave you then with two images. For those of you that feel that you can't change, and that nothing will change, I'll leave you with two images. Raise your hand if you know what this is. The bus stop, right? It's a bus stop. Most of us have been there. So the bus stop is not fun. It's not interesting. It's not you know, a place that you're going to go and, and have a lot of laughs. But it works. You get there early enough, you get a seat. If you don't, you stand. It's functional, the bus comes, you get on, and you go, right? Now, a lot of people would say, you don't have to change that. Sure, it's not fun, but it works. Why would you, why would you go and change that or invest in changing that? But sometimes it's just about perspective. And if you make one change, it can lead to a, a whole new concept. Because this is a bus stop, too. <laughs> this is a bus stop, an actual bus stop in Montreal, where somebody said, why can't you have fun at a bus stop, you know? So they took a totally different approach with this. So my, my feeling is this. If somebody can actually invent a bus stop that's fun, 
I have no doubt that you are going to continue to reinvent the shopping experience in this region. You are going to continue to lead the world in what you do. You just have to be willing to take that next step. Thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doug, an inspiration, a pleasure. Was I kidding when I said he was funny, engaging, and interesting? No, he's superb. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, listen, I made three promises to you about an hour and a half ago. One was that you'd learn something. Two was that you would contribute to the knowledge through your questions. And three was that you would make contacts. How am I doing on the first of those promises? Have you learned something new and interesting yet? Yes? Thank goodness for that, okay? I see nodding heads. Now, this is one of the sessions where I guess you can really contribute to the conversation and contribute to the discussion because it's our panel discussion now from souks to moles, what to expect in the next 20 years. We've got a superb panel of experts up here. It's going to be expertly moderated by our friend Mohammed Alawi, but also we'd love to get your contributions as well, your questions, your observations. Can I ask you for that? Can I ask you for that interaction? Thank you very much indeed. We're going to break for lunch in about 45, 50 minutes' time. Before that, though, it is my great pleasure to welcome back onto the stage the CEO of Red Sea Markets, Mohammed Alawi. Mohammed, please join us. First of all, thank you for accepting to see me again. When David called me uh, to, to moderate this panel, uh, he let me go back to the history. I'm 50 years old. And I remember when I grew in Mecca City, the holy city of Mecca, where the entertainment of my childhood it was all the old souks, souk al lail souk al mudda souk al this is where we grow, this is where we used to have fun, this is where we have a friend, and this is where we have even our needs. Our wedding used to be passed through those sugs. Our fury also has to, use, to, to go through that sugs and that. And to really make me more interested to, to talk about the past more than the shopping mall that I run those days. Uh, to make it short, I would like to invite uh, our distinguished panelists to, the, to, to, to join me for this panel. First of all, I would like to invite Mr. Nasif Kaid. He is uh, Managing Director for Sheikh Mohammed Center for Cultural Understanding in Dubai. Please join me, Mr. Nasif. <laughs> also, I would like to invite Mr. Abdullah Al Gorg. Abdullah Al Gorg is the Managing Director for the Aysal Gorg uh, Group in Dubai. Also, I would like to invite Mr. Philip Evans. He's the CEO of TriGrind uh, Management Company in UK. And I would like also to invite Mr. James uh, Skines. He's the Design Director, Middle East for Benoit. <laughs> so my first discussion will take, take us from the story that all of us had been in the region. And all of us also went through the experience of the souks and the bazaars. The souks in Dubai, Naif souks, souks in Al-Hamidiyya in Damascus, Khan al-Khalil in Egypt and many souks around the regions. The question is, with all those fast movement in the regions, and with all those fast buildings and high rises going on, and which one of the things that I noticed in, the, in a city like Mecca, had, most of those souks had been disappeared. I would like to start my discussion with all of you here to, to tell us from your experience, from your cities, how the involvement had been moved from the souks to the mall. How fast? What is the missing point in the middle? What is the experience that you, you're looking forward to see it in the shopping malls with the past history? And we'll start with you, Phil. Uh, uh, sorry, 
Mr. Nasik. Assalamu okay. uh, alaikum. How are we doing? Uh, after really all the technology that I saw, I would like to just go to the desert and just have a meal and a fire and <laughs> just detox. Uh, and it would be nice to just go back shopping at the souk too, actually, after you have gone to a Dubai mall and uh, saw the crowd and drove around for so long to park your car. Uh, I think the souks, the biggest jump is that in the old days and until today, it's the experience of being, uh, you feel at home, you feel that personal attention. You feel that you know the guy who you buy from for that so long. Today, when I go to the shops, the new shops, although it's a shop that I like to buy from, it is the ever-changing faces that you have to deal with. And they always have to get to know you from the scratch or you have to get to know them from the beginning. Um, it's a huge jump for us here in Dubai, particularly. I mean, for us, the souks were the only thing that we had, and not too long ago, Gurair Mall was the mall. Uh, today, it's Dubai Mall, Mall of Emirates, and the more malls come up, the more you confuse which one to go to, to shop, because uh, it's, sometimes it's the same experience. I would say that the souks uh, gave us what we needed before, and today the malls don't really give us as much as the souks gave us, and we need to just see what did we have, what was the pleasure and the really connection with the souk, and where can we find that connection again, especially with the young generation with the malls. So the internet is somewhere balanced between the two of them. But it happened too fast, too quick, and I feel uh, disconnect. Yes. Phil, for, Philip, from your side, as a Westerners, uh, I'm not aware about the, the old uh, merchandise, how it's going to there. Tell us, what is the past, what is the future? Well, I, I think the point was very well made about the, 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 the souks and the, the rich cultural tradition of the negotiation, the sitting down, the having a cup of coffee, the bartering, and that real integration and social experience between vendor and purchaser. And, and I think what we have lost today in retail <coughs> is that social integration. And the reason why people don't do all of their shopping on the internet is because they, they need that social experience. And that is the reason why they go to the shopping center to have that social experience. They don't need to. They can do it all, all, all at home and all online. And there's, I think there's a difference between what we need and what we want. What we need is our everyday purchases. And I think we as real estate owners, developers, managers, leasing people, need to understand this difference. And, and the need is about community-based retailing, hypermarket services, all of those things that we need in our daily lives. And then you move to the want part. And the want part is, what is it we desire at the weekend? How are we going to be entertained as a family? And I think the Middle East have been doing this very well because of the weather. People want to get out of the heat for four, five, six hours. And you can go to a shopping center and have an all-day experience. But the challenge for owners of real estate is, and our previous speaker spoke about this very well, is what can we do as owners of real estate and, and what can we do that scares us? Well, I'll tell you one thing that scares the banks and owners of real estate, and that is turnover rent. Because if people are going to a store and they're having an experience of a particular product and then they go home and purchase it online, then the retailer still, still gets his... His, uh, his sale, but the landlord and the owner of the shopping center doesn't get his turnover rent. So what I suggested to, a, to some bankers six months ago, and they were absolutely horrified by this, was that instead of owners getting their turnover rent, they get a percentage of revenue based on the number of people that they drive to that particular retail outlet. But let's face it, as an owner of real estate, it's not your responsibility to force the consumer to make that purchase within the particular retail outlet. All you can do is make them, bring them to the shopping center and give them a great social and interactive experience. And I think that's what the bazaars did very well in the souks exactly. in the past. So Dubai Mall, 75 million visitors last year. Wow, that's a great turnover. Yeah, but I think, you know, okay, you can take Dubai Mall and you can take Mall of the Emirates, but we all, we all know that those, those are off the radar. Okay. Um, the rest of the rest of this region, I'm sure, are not doing uh, as, as good sales. Abdullah, 
as we are as we are discussing and from the past speaker that retail also evolve from merchant to advanced retailer to e-commerce and e-retailing and uh, in the soups uh, to the mall books I had a fascinating some great picture one of them the Jashman store in Bahrain where all the camel passing in the front of the store and get me back all the history that's how the relation between the merchant with their suppliers and all those tenants. Tell us, how Dubai retailer evolve from your point of view? How you find them? Well, from my, first of all, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, from my, from my um, experience, from a, not as heavy on the retail aspect, but we are a trading house as a family. And I can tell you, um, as uh, Mr. Stevens alluded to, I think we uh, are trying to recreate the past through icons like uh, the Medina Jumeirah souk, like um, the, the old souk, the gold souk, the experience is quite important. So the recreation of those, re, um, um, uh, re the character of Dubai is what is happening. But if I wanted to give two small stories to, to this whole thing, and those are, you know, when you hang around with, with, the, with your old folks, they, they, they tell you a lot of stories and you have to store them because that's what, what it's all about, you know. <laughs> And, and you, you tend to use them in such functions. So one of the stories is that um, they wanted to, everybody knows the World Trade Center, just on the corner of Sheikh Zayed Road. And we, Dubai came from a, from, from a background of trade in Dera and, you know, Sug Murshid and all. And what happened is uh, Sheikh Rashid was advised that, you know, we'd like to build the Trade Center. And the first thing that all the merchants in Dubai came to Sheikh Rajid, Rashid with a big petition saying, are you going to close our souks and put it all in one big building? So it was, it was such a big controversial thing for us to change our mindsets from, from that to this. Second uh, um, ev you know, evolution to, to the dynamics of the malls, if you may say, is, is, the, is the DAOs that we have, on the DAOs on Benia Street. If you go and look at the, 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 the creek, uh, we started off, the UAE started off with, with two DAOs, one going to Iran and the other one going to India, coming to Dubai and trading that uh, and creating that trade hub in, 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 in Dubai. The, the beautiful Persian carpets, the pistachios, the herbs from India, the tangerines, and all came back to Dubai and tried to, to set up uh, here. We're now up to 11,000 DAOs, 11,000 DAOs. And 68% of them trade to sister and neighboring countries. And that shows you that the level of trade of merchant and the level of retail experience is still existent in the local market. And it's in the genes and the dynamics of what we are all about. Yes, e-commerce is quite important, but from an, from an Arab tradition, Unless you see the fabric in front of you and unless you see the glass in front of touch you it. and touch it and feel it, you feel very weary about paying for, for something. So we're not that prepared yet to, to, to elevate to the level of the, of the amazing um, um, technology that was just exhibited in the past hour. James, you are in the hot seat. You are in the design. <laughs> and people, they keep accusing that you guys are trying to intimidate uh, to duplicate the, the, the historic with the new models, the Jumeirah, Pimbatuta, Mall, with all the past and history of all other country. First of all, is that true? Is it succeeding, all those projects with these ideas you're coming with it? I'm not talking about your company, I'm talking as, as a design guy, and this duplication going all over. Uh, are we, are, are we are, uh, changing the past with this uh, modern building and modern uh, souks and modern shopping malls with some touches with the past? Well, first, thank you uh, for the opportunity and privilege uh, to be here as, a, as the only architect or designer up here at the moment. Um, I believe that, that as uh, commercial retail is always trying to find a way to increase its exposure and profitability, so as designers, we're always trying to stay ahead of the curve of what people are looking for, what people are wanting. And there's always that dynamics between commercial 
viability and cutting edge design and ideas. There's always that tension. And I think as designers, we're always trying to move towards the leading, the cutting edge side of design. So we're always pushing the envelope. But what we find very often is that we come back to what works. And what we've seen in the, the whole transformation from the initial trading post that people got together crossing rivers or paths in the desert to trading their goods one to another to the shopping mall today is it's both. It's about convenience. It's about getting something you don't have quickly and effectively. But it's also about experience. Inevitably, we come together as individuals with families and children, and I might want the convenience of getting something quickly, but my family, my wife, my children want to have fun. So inevitably, as a designer, looking at the sook, it's come full circle. We've incorporated those elements in the malls today, largely unsuccessfully, I believe, because we tried to take something that was uh, very much about an experience of what you mentioned about having a relationship, and we've tried to take just the, the mechanics of a sook and put it in a mall, and I think it's been largely unsuccessful. What people want is that, that experience of, of the smells, the touch, but also the relationships. I think one of the phenomena that, that we see today very clearly is that technology, while it's, while it's moving on, people still want the personal social aspect of going with their friends and meeting people and seeing faces that, that they know. So I think there's that dynamics that, gotcha. that we see in the Sook that we have to continually try to find those experiences in our shopping centers today. Mr. Nasif, uh, customer behavior change and, and also trying to adapt a new ideas and new things. Through your centers in Dubai, did you done any research about the behaviors of the customers or what is their now movement, what the, the trends in their behaviors, what they like, what they don't like? Are they back to the old tools? Are any, any studies you could share with us? Well, they, I would say that the people like the experience of the old and the new at the same time, but for us really to have a happy medium for the next 20 years, uh, there is, first of all, the way when we design, it's two different designs for big boxes and stock market retailers and individual retailers. Okay. It's two different animals here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is the difference of when we uh, get the uh, tenant or we do also for the client or for the shopper. For the uh, tenant, you have to make their lives also easy and comfortable, uh, where if you go to the souk, everything goes, and there is not so many restrictions on the uh, retailer to bring their goods, to deliver their goods, to pick up their goods, to move their goods. It looks like a chaos, but they are happy and they're getting along. Where you go in a mall or you go in a shopping center, and this is only the delivery dock, and this is only the pickup, and it becomes a bit of a miserable experience to just be a tenant in a shopping center. Uh, for me as a shopper, I would like that experience where uh, it, it's conducive for families. Uh, most of us here, especially in the Middle East, we are families. We take our wife and kids with us uh, and we go there and we want a place for the kids. Maybe in the old days, my dad sat me at the shop and he said, just stay with uncle so-and-so or with, you know, what's his name and I'll be back in a couple. Today you go take them to these uh, playgrounds and it's not really uh, as safe, I feel, where if the shopping center had, let's say like even with Mall, technically speaking, if each area or open area was a place for an area where while you're shopping, you could always uh, actually look out and see your kids playing in something that is very nearby rather than so far away and you have to go across the mall. Uh, for me, let's say like for us here, uh, they like the concept of that there is a place for prayer, there is a place for, uh, let's say like... Uh, uh, the sitting to take a seat. Sometimes I go in malls and there is no place to sit and I'm tired of walking around. And, uh, the, you know, you get like to the point where you have to go to the food court and it's all the way at the other end. All those new designs that we did took away from the souk when the mix is really nice. And I, I like the idea. Today we are repeating some of that where you go to a hallway and it's all the 
uh, kids stuff and all the jewelry stuff that's good because at one time we spread it all out and it became confusing it became frustrating uh, to take the experience of the past and the present the people want safety they want family they want to be have convenience let's say like to worship or to uh, washrooms they want to have the convenience of uh, being able to deal with the stores of the same category next to each other uh, these are the things that I think that we have to kind of balance between the past and the present. Okay. I would like to, to leave some room for if anybody have any question or, uh, or any discussion if you would like to join us before we continue on this side. Any hand, any questions? Okay. Philip, tell us from your experience. I know that you're doing some business in Asia. Okay. And Asia also, today I was hearing the story about 1,000 more in last year, mm -hmm. last two years. That means you are demolishing a lot of the heritage and a lot of old zoos and old streets. Tell us some more about the experience in Asia. Are the people happy about it? Is people accepting the new change on the trends? Is, is, is the new format of shopping malls easy for the old generator, the generation? No, it's not. Uh, I think one thing that is very disappointing from my experience about working in China is that they are turning their back, it seems to me, on their own rich culture and heritage. Mm -hmm. They seem to want to embrace all things West, and even in, in design and the way that they shop and the brands and everything. And uh, we were talking to um, one member of the, uh, of the party in the, in the city of Longzhou, uh, and he said, you know, we want a Western-style shopping center. We want everything, the customer service. And yes, there are many things that, uh, about the way that we do business in the West um, that China does need to embrace, particularly customer service, because China does have some of the worst customer service in the world. But uh, as I said to them, you have such a rich heritage in this country. Why don't we design something that embraces both parts, the new and the old, and we try and mix the two together? So I think that's, uh, that's a disappointing thing from, uh, from the Chinese perspective. And, and clearly, what is happening in China is the urbanization, and Michael talked about the, the growth of the middle class, and China and India are two of the biggest markets in the world which are driving that growth in, uh, in the middle class spend. And what we, what we are seeing uh, in, in China is mass urbanization. And many developers are building residential and selling, res selling residential, but they don't really care about the retail. They just know that as part of their building permit, they've got to build X square meters of, of retail. And there is no more thought that goes into it than that. And so what you're finding is of these thousands of shopping centers that are being built, a, a lot of them are, in a few years' time will be distressed assets, are distressed assets right now, and are, and are white elephants. And we went to, see, to visit a city uh, a, a few months ago, and that had a shopping center which was um, 4 million square feet and not a single tenant. It had been built and never been occupied. And this is what you find throughout every city in China is it's, it's mass building, but it's not very well thought out. And therein lies an opportunity for someone. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Abdullah, do you think the retailer are ahead in the game of satisfaction of their customer than the developer? Who is in the driving seat now? Is it the retailer, is it the customer, or the developer in terms of satisfaction and uh, providing the needs they're looking for? The needs of the customer. customer yeah. Look, I'm, I'm sitting in a room, a bunch of landlords, so I really need Don't to... Worry. to I'm, I'm one of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm a tenant in many of those malls, in Dubai Mall, in Emirates Mall, in many of our retail shops. And I've been accused sometimes of saying inappropriate comments towards certain aspects. <laughs> so I'm just letting you know, it's a landlord's market. Yeah. To hell with the retailer. Oof. That is how we see it as retailers. To be very honest and crude. Um, I don't know how much can we survive on that notion. There's a rent. There is a marketing fee, there is a security fee, there is an AC drainage fee, I don't know what, fee, 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 fee. By the end of it, you tend to, you know, just, if you're selling garments, you might as well, you know, you, you, you sell 80% of the year for the mall, and 20%, it's like more than the tax in Italy, you know? <laughs> so, uh, this is the perspective of how malls, or developers are operating here currently. 
the responsibility of the experience is the retailers, is the shop, the, the, the person who has opened his shop. The problem is, is that when this retailer comes to open at a mall, is he, he is confronted with having to satisfy the landlord, but at the same time having to satisfy the customer, and is preoccupied with those two things while he does not have time to innovate and create and, and recreate the experience which he's supposed to do. So what we need to do is we need to take stock and go a step back. Yes, capitalism is an interesting word, and I agree it is a, it is a capitalist market, and we all live in it, but we need to take a step back and look at what is the survival mode of the retailer, how can we help this retailer to be more innovative? Rather than squeezing him on turnover, give him space to create value from within, which is exactly those value-added technologies which we alluded to. And that is what's missing in the current can situation. I, come on the point next? I think it's a very, very valid point. I think the responsibility of the landlord, and we are a landlord back in, back in, uh, in Europe, but we're also a, a consultant where we act for I, I apologize if I've landlords. offended anybody. So I, in the I agree with a lot of points you, you make, but I think the, the, the future of retail is it, the, the landlord has a responsibility to create a functional place and a sustainable place. Right. Yeah. And he has to create the platform, and this is an architectural responsibility as well. It's not about grand architecture. The best architecture is where the retail uh, is, is the only thing that catches your eye. We have to create a platform for the retailers to excel. Finished. The rest is a retail responsibility. And the retailers stores will become far more market showrooms. Yeah. And uh, don't agree to our tenancy if you don't like us in the mall. Do you know? But once you give us and open the door, then let's, we're all equal. And that's the problem. Absolutely. It should be a that, true partnership. Yeah. And the, 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 the leasing division needs to be enhanced in its... I'm not saying the, the landlord himself. I'm saying the leasing sector has to be developed to reach to that level. Uh, if I may, you look at the numbers short term or long term. Short term is the problem because you keep the turnover and then if you calculate long term, you're actually not as uh, well off. Uh, a tenant that stays there for 20 years is a lot better than having two, three tenants in the 20 years and you have, co uh, you know, uh, uh, what do we call it? Uh, lawyer's fees and court uh, costs and all these things. Uh, the way I look at it, an empty and vacant space. Yeah, I, I'd just like to say that possibly behind that question, whether it's the developer, whether it's the retailer, whether it's the landlord, or whether it's the shopper, behind all of those are decisions. And decisions come from our ability to think creativity, creatively. So I believe from, and I might say this because I'm a designer, as an architect, but I think behind all of that is creative design. So regardless of whether you're a developer or a retailer, we need to have forward-thinking design to stay ahead of the game. I'm working currently with uh, one of the sponsors here, Hamat and Asala, on a project in uh, Saudi Arabia, in, uh, in Riyadh. And uh, when Asala approached us to design a, a new shopping uh, experience in Riyadh, they wanted something different. They wanted to lead by example, and they've come up with something that I do believe has blended the old and the new. It's, the, it's an outside-inside shopping experience. It's something that blends both the experience and the convenience that, that we've been discussing all into one package. Uh, and I believe that that is the trend. It's taking the elements of the souk and the elements that work in the mall and blending them together into making an experience that's both convenient and attractive uh, for the whole family. Philip, uh, in, the, in the era of the e-commerce and all those online shopping and virtual malls and things, do you think that we're going to lose the experience of shopping in the middle of that? There, there is a risk that if you don't reinvent, then you will die. Um, plainly, but I, I, I don't think we will lose the shoppers because the shoppers do need that social integration. Um, uh, uh, as I said, I think 
we have to create shopping centers that engage the entire family at the weekend. And that means that every decision that we take when we arrive in that shopping center is a subconscious one because it has been designed well. So the natural flow around the shopping center works. There is things to do for the father. There are things to do for the kids. Mum and dad can have, a, have lunch and watch the kids while they're being entertained, the point that you made, you made earlier. If you can physically sit there in a restaurant and watch them in an entertainment center or on a climbing wall, whatever, watching them while they are engaged in an activity. And if, if father is happy, happy, then mother can go and spend two, three hours shopping and doing what she wants. But if you do not get one of those ingredients right, then the whole one member of that family unit is distressed, fed up, and creates havoc for everybody else. So you have to engage the entire family. And if you do that, then shopping, there's no reason why shopping centers can continue to survive for the next 100, 200 years. But it's, 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 but it's embracing technology um, and, and understanding that the, mo the person who knows most about that product in the shopping center is no longer the retailer, it's the consumer. And the, the high mam sir and some naive upsell, which you sometimes get in this region, I think we have to focus far more on proper customer service and, and really train the people in our stores so that they understand the concept of quality customer care, but also quality product knowledge as well, because the, the customer is very, very well informed. James, I have one question. It's about, there is a now the trend of transferring uh, what they call it, cultural from their real region to others. Taj Mahal to Las Vegas, the Swiss Alp to Dubai Mall, to the, the South African Ocean to Dubai, the Dubai Mall Aquariums, rather than capitalize on what we have on the region. I won't be surprised to see a slope of sand slope in the region with all the sand we have it. So. Tell us why, why designers sometimes they try to, to, is it just uh, transferring a culture to another culture? What is the point of to seeing Taj Mahal in Sweden rather than to see something, the Viking stories in Sweden? Why well, those, I, those mix? I think if we go back to the earliest uh, examples of uh, trading in the desert or the, or the souk, you'll probably find that the success of that sook or that trading environment was the fact that it carried something that you couldn't get in the region. It had a spice that wasn't available. It had a fabric that wasn't available. It had something that attracted people to that place to get something they couldn't get at home. I think it largely designers today and developers today are trying to attract the greatest population to their venue, to their destination, and so they're looking for something that doesn't exist in their, in their environment. So they're attracting slopes from the Alps to Dubai or an aquarium from regions of the oceans to, uh, to Dubai. They're attracting things uh, that are unique that people can come. And it also creates an international destination that people from those regions when they come can experience bits of pieces of other parts of the world. I think it's all about creating new experience. I'm not saying it's all right, I'm not saying that it's all been done correctly, but I think the motive is very clear. They're trying to, the same thing that the trader that was bringing silk from China to Afghanistan to, to sell, it's the same thing. We're trying to bring something here that, that we don't have and, and market it. Nasser, would you like to comment about this mix of culture? Uh, I think we should uh, th seriously think about the culture and the people of uh, their habits and the norms that uh, pertain to whether you Asian, Arab, uh, Westerner, or uh, African. Uh, it is very important that we have these uh, born and raised with habits. And when I go to a place that is catering for me, I feel connected, I feel at home, I feel comfortable. And today, uh, we are in a world that is very connected. People come and shop at these malls that we have here in Dubai from all over the world. Do we just cater to just the locals and not everybody else? We will lose so many. Do we cater to everybody that comes, but not those who are locals? Look like today we have uh, nationalities that's come in Dubai that we never expected for them to come and shop here, actually, when we first put these malls together. 
uh, I would say yes, become uh, very universal and just make your uh, uh, retail uh, space for whether the tenants or whether the customers that it caters to everybody at once. And let it be just like an excursion for people to come here, enjoy their own, and everybody else's at the same time. Can I just add, add one thing? I think the, the contextual aspect of, of uh, architecture is very, very important. I think regardless of the elements that we bring in, whether we're bringing silk and spices from different places or events or ski slopes or uh, water slides or whatever it, it is, I think architecturally trying to find an element of contextualism to bring into that space is very, very important. I think it's a point of difference. If I come to Dubai, I want to, to feel like I'm in Dubai. I don't want to feel like I'm in America or, or some, other, some other region of the world. So I think, yeah, I do think architecture has a, our designers and developers have a responsibility to try to find a way to contextualize a space. And it doesn't always mean pastiche. It doesn't mean copying the arches or the, the, the towers in the architecture. It means finding what is the essence of that culture in building that into the architecture or the spaces. Abdullah, is the local retailer having their chance with this new modern shopping mall? Are they being treated fair, they think, or just being kept on the sugs? And are, are they also adapting all the changing habits in the shopping malls? I saw a few of the ouds and things. They are, they are adopting the new retail format. How about the rest of the uh, old traditional retailer? Are they adapting to this? And they and they having fair chance from shopping mall to deal with them? Well, I think I, I can't answer that question as much as a landlord would answer the question. But I must say that you, when you go to those shopping malls, you see a lot of shops that are of traditional, like uh, the textile shops and the old shops and all. They have to elevate to be able to, to, to be accommodated in those malls. Um, there is a market for that, but um, a true buyer will not go to um, a Dubai mall to buy uh, a certain genuine local product, or a true buyer will not go to a big commercial mall in Saudi Arabia. But, uh, he'll go to the true gold souk, to the true you know, perfume section of that old small area. They'll, they'll look at it as an experience. So the customer is still interested in, in taking the bus from his, from his, uh, uh, from his uh, hotel and, and get into um, that small destination that he goes to, to get this experience that he's looking at. So... Um, well, I will leave the floor now for any question before we conclude our panel. Any questions? That boring we are today? <laughs> or busy or hungry? Yeah. Anyway. Brian, but, from technology, here we have a question. Okay. to comment? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, four months of the year are intolerable in this part of the world. So you have no option but to get into a mall and shop. So shopping malls are quite convenient. And there's nothing much in the Middle East that you can go and do besides enjoy a mall as much as possible. I mean, you can't sit and people watch as much as you sit in Paris on the, on the, on, on, or on the Champs-Élysées. Or that, that's not the experience in this part of the world. So. The, the people experience, the people interaction is much more available um, in, in, in shopping malls in Dubai. I think the sales per square foot are much higher in indoor air-conditioned um, areas from our experience. Um, the outdoor uh, experience is potentially good in the food and beverage area, mostly, when the, when in three to four months of the year. And that is potentially what we see um, um, as the trend, typically. From our experience. The last thing that we'd like to talk about is the book, which is the, the one who drives this panel. This book had been published by the MACC and ICC, and I think will be distributed today for the gala dinners. And I've been told also, if anybody interested to 
to have a limited copy for his company with the company logo, the name, could also approach David or Vina, and I think that's a good ad. I have to admit, it's a piece of art, this book, and uh, I would like to thank all the people who have worked on, on that, in this book uh, to be produced. Finally, I would like to thank all those great panelists here, and thank you all for listening to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you indeed to our panelists, and of course, Mohammed, to you for your second appearance on stage today. You're doing the heavy lifting today, shukran. We appreciate it. Inshallah, we look forward to that. More on tonight in a couple of moments' time. Listen, we're going to break for lunch uh, very, very shortly. A couple of bits of housekeeping, okay. Later on today, about 3 o'clock, we've got the breakout sessions. One's with Paul Fetcher. The rooms have changed. That's now up on the mezzanine. Floor, uh, salon three, okay. If you want Paul's session later on today, that is floor three, okay. Paul is going to be, is going to be there. If you want uh, to go to Patricia's seminar, though, Patricia Norris, converting temporary tenants to permanent, Patricia is going to be in the Sahab meeting room, this floor opposite the ballroom, okay. Patricia, this floor, Paul upstairs on the mezzanine. Ask the guys outside at registration. They can help you with all of that. Now, talking of registration, I think David mentioned, didn't he, this morning that the gala dinner is sold out. Fantastic. Looking forward to that this evening. Looking forward to seeing you there. Now, how do you know whether or not you've got a ticket? Well, if you look at your tag, I'm told, those with a red sticker, those are the ones that are the tickets to the gala dinner. Again, if you're in any way unsure, just have a chat with the people who are outside here, and they'll be happy to help you with that. That's the gala dinner this evening. The cocktail reception starts from 6, and then the awards starts at 7 o'clock this evening. So please be back for that. Now, what we're going to do is take a break for lunch. So do please go and enjoy your lunch outside. We'll be back here. What time is it now? Let me check. It's 12.21 uh, by now. Jean-Marc uh, Pontru is going to be here at 2 o'clock this afternoon from Roger uh, Dubuis, he, the watchmaker. He's the chief executive, knows a whole bunch about luxury retail. He's worked for LVMH, he's worked for Mont Blanc, now Roger Dubuis. He's going to be sharing his insights then. So can I ask you to be back here uh, for, for Jean-Marc at 2 o'clock? Yeah, looking forward to that. In the meantime, enjoy your lunch. And I'm going to leave you, okay, with a short video teasing ahead a taster of what we've got to look forward to at the gala dinner this evening. Thanks very much indeed, and I'll see you later on. <laughs>